words in different places. So you can't use two Fs in coefficient in your code and one F above, they won't know what you're talking about. Another thing that comes up is NetLogo, unlike other programming languages, because it's a free form and interpreted language, is very sensitive to spacing, right? So you can't, in, in, in Java or C or a bunch of other languages, I could just say if X less than coefficient innovation like that, NetLogo is going to say that's a, thinks that's a name and isn't going to be able to interpret it. It doesn't care how many spaces you put in, but you have to put some space between every little symbol, right? And so you have to have those spaces in there, right? Okay. Any other questions? So the one thing is, is that right now, we, yeah. So I thought I might have to get it going today. Okay. Because the observer, only the observer can ask yeah. the set of alternatives. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Why is it? I wonder why it's done. Oh, it's patches. Oh, that's the problem. Yep. I didn't even talk about that. Okay. But yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Is it worth asking what patches is or is that? Yeah, you have to type go. Yeah, and then you have to type it a couple of times before it steps forward. So you were in the you were talking to it's, you found a feature of NetLogo that I hadn't talked about, which is that I can actually talk directly to the turtles or directly to the patches by changing what it says down there. Um, and so you were asking the patches of the, the underlying environment in NetLogo, and you're asking all the patches to do something, right? Okay. okay. Yeah. I just said one more thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we put all this here, and then. I'm gonna get it to execute. Because so you go, yeah. So you go back here, type setup. Oh. This right here. Yep, right there. Type setup. Uh, One word. Uh, <laughs> hit enter. And now hit go. Hit enter. And you see, you see one right now? Oh. Because before we were working with the interface, they had to set up and go. Yep, and in fact, I'm gonna show you how to create those right now. So, as many of you know from working with NetLogo models before, usually you actually have buttons for setup and go, right? Well, you can easily create these buttons. Up here at the top, there's this little add button. If I click there, and then I click down here, I can create a new button, and I can have it run one of my own commands. So I can have it run setup, for instance. And I can create a new one for go. And you don't, the display name, the command is what you're telling it to execute. The display name is, can be whatever you want. It's just what's going to show up on the button. Usually, we make them the same for most things because it makes sense. So now I can just click setup and then click go. Now, another thing you may have remembered from working with your other models is that you probably don't have to keep clicking go on most of those models because you click it once and it runs. So you can control click on the go or right click on a PC and hit edit. And there's this little button called forever. And if that's on, what that means is it'll continue to execute that command as long as the button is pushed. And so now I can hit set up and then hit go and you'll see they quickly all turn red. Set up, go, set up, go. All right. Any questions about that? Do that one more time? Okay. So, let me delete the ones I have. So you can add a button by just clicking the little green button here and clicking in the space, the white space, right? And then I just need to tell it what the command is I want it to execute. So in this case, it's set up. And I can add another button and call it go, and if we go, we usually want to click the forever button. Makes sense there, right? Really? 
And talking about interface elements, as you know from the other net logo models, a lot of times you don't want just buttons. You also want sliders, right, to be able to control input variables. So I can also create those. So I go up to button, I select slider instead, and then hit um, the add. Oh, actually it was already highlighted. I dehighlighted. And now I can create a slider and I can give it a name. And these are variable names uh, that, any, that any part of the NetLogo code can access. So one common one to put in here is you say uh, number of people, num people, right? And actually I usually like to make it bigger than 100, so let's say 500. And what you're specifying here is you're specifying what's the minimum value, what's the increment, so as I move that slider, what's the various ticks it takes on, and what's the maximum value it takes on, and then this is just some default value that it has, but as soon as you slide it's going to change that default value. I have one question. Yeah. You can make that number anything you want. You can make that number anything you want. Yeah. We have a question. I, I don't remember what the top level of agents in that logo before it blows up. Oh, how big can it get? How many, how many? That really depends. Actually, actually, we ran into this back here. Oh. It depends upon the, the size of your memory, honestly. You can, uh, I've run net logo models with 50,000 agents before, easily. And I know people that have run them on bigger machines with a million agents. So, um, now those weren't desktop machines, the million. The 50,000 was a desktop, that was a desktop machine. That was just like my normal PC in my office, right? Um, and a lot of it depends on how much memory allocation you can do. Um, and there's actually some tricks if you run into Linux where it's giving you errors. That was actually, I think what happened with your code back there where it was generating an error, I think you had hit setup so many times you had created a lot, a lot of agents and it was running into a problem with that. So as soon as we cleared the world, it was fine, right? Yeah. Um, but um, uh, but uh, you, there's actually some command tricks that you can do to actually even increase that artificially, so. Yeah, um, anything, you know, anything around 1,000 to 10,000, you're okay, right? Actually, I would tend to stay under 1,000 for any of your prototype models that you're playing around with anyways, right? Just because the more you add, the slower it's gonna run, right? Which means that you really wanna make sure the model's working well. You know, again, keeping it simple, right? Don't start by modeling a one-to-one -one population for the entire US, right, you know? Start at 100 people and then see how we can add to it, right? Okay. So, uh, num people 50, but the problem is just because I created that doesn't mean it's going to affect anything, right? If I move that slider way up here and hit setup, I still only see 100 agents, right? So what I need to go do is go back to the code, and instead of saying create 100 up here, I say create num people. Okay? Make sense? And now, if I say 300, you can definitely see there are more than if I say 68, for instance. Right? So actually, I know it seems like it's taking us a while to get to it, but the first one always takes a while. We've now done everything on this thing, except for the optional one of having different thresholds for different agents, but we can talk about that. So the next model I was going to do is add P and Q sliders and then have them adopt based upon P and Q, right? Um, and this was the coefficient imitation and coefficient innovation, right? Um, so we pretty much have done that. They're already basically adopting based upon P. What we might want to do is add a sliders. And so sometimes, you know, you might call it global innovation just to differentiate it from the coefficient of innovation that all the agents have, right? So this is just a generic property. And this time, we're going to want it to be a re real value number, so we're going to want to change all those values. So we're going to have a minimum of 0, increment of 0 0.05, and a maximum of 1.0. And obviously, you don't want the value to be 50, right? Put the 0 0.07. Right. Good. Okay. Now we can do the same thing for the global imitation slider. Okay. 
And this time I'll set it to 0 0.5. So the nice thing about this model is I can now define all the parameters in my model. There are no other parameters in this model except for the network structure, but we'll talk about that. Yeah? Can we go back to global limitation again, please? Yep, no problem. Yeah. Because this is a probabilistic model, those global variables don't. What? Because this is a probabilistic model, I'm not going to say it's exactly right, those global variables have to vary between 0 and 1. Then you're going to... Essentially, because the fact we're treating these as probabilities, yes, that is correct. I mean, you're right. Realistically, because it's, you know, that's only because of the way we're thinking about the model. Um, realistically, they could vary between zero and a thousand as long as you are making the right scalings and doing everything appropriately. That'd be fine. But it's easier for most people who are coming from an equation-based mindset to think about this to think about them as probabilities. In reality, because it's a computational mindset now, as long as you have different levels, it doesn't matter too much. But yes, you're right. There's just some additional programming you use. Exactly. Absolutely. Data quantities from your sample. Right, right, exactly, exactly. You'd have to think about how they should be interpreted. Okay, so now that we have those, right, we can actually, so we used to say set coefficient innovation 0 0.0707. Now we can say set it to the global innovation and set the coef of imitation to the global imitation. Right? One quick note, by the way. Anytime you see in your NetLogo model a number, right, like 0 0.007 or 0 0.05, usually that means that that really should be a parameter of your model, right? Because it really means that it's something that, especially a weird number like 0.07, it's something that has some effect on the way the model runs. And you should at least make it a parameter, even if it's like, I know it's always going to be 0.07. Should make it a parameter just so you can see is the model robust to changes in that parameter, right? And test it. Uh, very, very rarely should you have a number, a very peculiar number in your model hard coded into your model, right? Um, like 1.0 is fine because we know we just need to generate a random probability. So it's okay to have a 1.0 in there because we know you can't have a probability greater than one, right? So that's fine. But so let's just test this real quick, right? So we have a model, and if we hit, if we hit type go once, just to make it run once, we can see that the adoption rate is really low, right? So let's check this by changing our, our global innovation value to make it really high, right? Now, if I hit go right now, it doesn't change the innovation rate. And that's because I set the coefficient of innovation in the setup routine. And I haven't touched the setup routine again. I've only been hitting the go routine, right? So if I hit setup again, and now I go to go, you'll see instantly 80% of the world changes to adopting the idea, right? So my, the, it's, it's important, another little step about verifying each base models is to make sure that you're checking that the code change you just made and how you think it's gonna change the model actually has the effect. And a lot of times this means changing the parameters way outside what you actually expect to use just to see the results quickly, right? It's, um, it's sometimes called component verification, right? You're essentially making a small component change and then you're checking to make sure that that component creates the results that you anticipate it should create. Okay, so I'll set it back to a reasonable level. Now the other thing is we don't have global imitation affecting the model at all right now. Um, that's because global imitation in the end is going to be affected by the network neighborhood and we don't have a network neighborhood yet. So let's get to that.
Yeah, I'm going to actually skip ahead to model four so we can make sure we get to that. Right. Okay. So how do you add a network to net logo, right? That's kind of the part we're at right now, right? And the way you do that is that it turns out links are actually a built-in part of net logo. Any turtle can have a link to any other turtle. And that represents a social network, essentially, right? And so we're gonna add those by having the turtles create, actually we're gonna go outside of, no, we can do it here. That's good, okay, good. I did this in the right way. Create links, create link with one of other turtles. Let me unpack that because that's kind of a, it reads and makes sense when you read it, right? <laughs> but you know, you're not sure what all the commands are doing. This is the beauty of NetLogo. You can read it even if you don't know the language and usually it does what you think it does, but let me explain to you what it's doing. Turtles tells me, give me the set of all turtles out there, right? That includes myself, right? Because I'm talking to one turtle right now. Other turtle says, take myself out of that set, right? One of says, give me a random one of any set. So this is saying, take all the turtles, take myself out of the choice, so I don't create a link to myself. We don't allow people to be friends with themselves in this model, right? And give me a random one of those people. And that's going to create a link to one of those turtles, right? So this can be a random network, by the way, in this particular context. And that's all you need. You now have a social network, by the way. That's how easy it is in, in that logo. Right? If I hit setup, you'll see a bunch of friendship ties. And you're not going to see them on here. Let me do. Uh, what's that command? Yeah, I know. Just things. I'm just doing this. You don't have to do this. I'm just doing this to make it so you can see my links. Oh, that's too thick. <laughs> There you go. How much did you invent for me? Oh, so actually, that little automatically invents for you. If you, if you go, if you type a bracket and hit enter, it will put you in the right space below it, right? And if you hit the tap button, if you're on a line and you're in the wrong space, like, like say I'm over here, if I hit. If I hit tab, it automatically takes me back to the right place, right? So as long as I'm in that line and I'm in the right space, I hit tab, it'll try and figure out where I should be. The, if you want to know, that's only as of NetLogo 5. Before that, everyone had to do their own manual indentation, and the default was two spaces, two spaces, two spaces, right? Um, but NetLogo now does it for you automatically, pretty much. Okay. Yeah? You have an open bracket after ask turtles and another one after other turtles. Yep. Is there a closed bracket in between, or you don't need no, that? No, no, because what I'm doing here, is, you have to think about it as a step-by-step -step process, right? Okay. What is Ask Turtles doing? It's going through every single set of turtles and asking them each to do something, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when I get to a turtle, what am I asking it to do? Well, I'm asking it to set a bunch of its properties, set its XY coordinates, set its color, right? But then one of the things I'm doing is I'm having it create a link. Now, I did do something here that I haven't talked about before. Whenever you create an object, you can do an implicit ask at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So really what this is saying, the way to read this, is create link with one of other turtles, ask that link I just created to do something, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, I'm asking that link I just created to do thickness. So this turtle who just created this link is now asking that link to do something. So I need to have this turtle and I need to know it's at that link. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So they're embedded inside of each other as well. I have one question. Yes. Yeah. I'm so great to this, but um, I see that they're, well, at least on my computer, they're different colors for different Yep, words. there are. Yep. So is that like based on the command syntax? Yep, yep, exactly. Great point. 
if you don't type, this is actually one thing I was using before and I didn't explain it. Anytime you type a command, it will highlight automatically in blue for you in that logo. If you type a function, a function is something that expects an input, right? It will highlight it in purple for you, right? And if you type um, a property, it also highlights in purple, doesn't it? Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, and then uh, things that are inputs, right? Or things that are defined inputs, like numbers, false, true, etc., those are in red essentially throughout, right? And then the black. And the black is used for what's left over, mainly variables, right? Or user-defined vari user-defined functions. It's probably a more explicit way to say that. If you look in the NetLogo program guide, I'm sure you'll find it. But that's roughly what it, the breakdown is. Well, this is good because. That's one of the ways that I like seeing if I'm doing it right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 So if I mistype a command, <laughs> if I mistype a command, it will let me know, right? So let's say I thought the command was create link together. I don't know why I thought it was that, but you know, it's in black, and I know it's in black, so I know it's not an actual command. If I say create link with, all of a sudden it changes to blue because NetLogo recognizes that as a command. Basically, if it's in black, it's something that logo can't automatically recognize, right? It's like a, a variable you created, or it's a number, or something like that, right? Is there another question? We just, you can paste them out of the uh, help directory. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, in fact, you can even select, so like, let's say I wanted, I'm doing create link with, and I can't remember what it is. I can do look up in dictionary, and it'll take me directly to the help manual, create link with. Right, right there. Right and then there's a bunch of commands right there. Yeah, and I can, what Liz is saying is I can take like random float, hit, copy it, and paste it directly in there, right? Okay. So um, I'm getting close to the end of time. I didn't want to make sure we respect that. So I'm going to basically show you guys how to finish this model in terms of looking at uh, adoption by imitation, and I think we'll wrap up, right? Um, we got, I think we got pretty close to the model. We went sometimes one thing, so we didn't get a chance to look at were what would the outputs look like, right? Um, how to run experiments, stuff like that. But this kind of gets you a good start as to what's going on in this space. So basically, the way I'm going to write the code to handle uh, imitation, right? So in a nice way, this uh, the way. If I were to write the mathematical equation for this, it's coef of innovation plus coef of imitation times the fraction of my neighbors who have adopted, right? This is not code, this is just me using this as a scratch pad, by the way, right? So, and you see a plus in a probabilistic determination, it means that they're independent of each other. So we can actually treat them independent of each other and do two separate probability calculations. So I can check to see is the um, is the coefficient is is the x less than the coefficient of innovation, and then I can set the x to another random float less than one, and do another independent try to see if it's less than the imi imi coefficient of imitation, and for that I want to do coef of imitation times. Let's see, this is the part that gets a little tricky. Count link neighbors with, and this, I'm kind of rushing through this a little bit, sorry. Divided by count. Okay. And this doesn't even all fit on one's line. Okay. Let's see if I can make this bigger for you guys. That's about as big as it's going to get. Is there a way to pull it off the second line? <laughs> you can, but it, so it involves, let's, let's do that. That's actually a good thing. Let's do that. The best way to do that is actually to break out what you're doing in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to set, let fraction adopted. Let's see, let number, let num adopted. 
the account link neighbors with adopted. And let num neighbors be count link neighbors. And then this is just num adopted divided by num neighbors. Right? So basically, what I did to make it a little easier is I just did all the calculations in steps rather than doing it all in one line. Let me, let me talk you through this, right? So let num adopted be count link neighbors with adopted. So link neighbors is a built-in NetLogo command that gives you the set of all the people you're linked to, right? So it's a set of all those individuals, right? So everyone I have a link with, right? Link neighbors with adopted means look to see if they have adopted. If that value is true, then keep them in the set. If it's not true, throw them away, right? Then just count how many that is. So how many people in that set of all my link neighbors have adopted the idea, right? Does that make sense? And then count link neighbors is just what it says. It's counting how many people are in the underlying set. So if I want the fraction of individuals who have adopted, that's simply the number of individuals who have adopted divided by the number of individuals that exist, right? Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So the answer, the quick answer to your question, is it possible to run in a line? Is no, it's not. Um, the, so anytime you're spilling that line over, it usually means you probably have too much code in that line and you should break it up, right, into multiple parts, which is what I just did. Is there a continuation thing, though? I, no. <laughs> there isn't. <laughs> Um, no. Yeah. So once I've done all this, no, nope. forgot something. Forgot my left bracket right there, right, to indicate this is the start of a block. Once I've done all this, now I can. So, one way to check this, let me see. So I can hit setup and I can hit go, and you see it goes really, really quickly, right? Um, there's actually a speed slider up here, so I wouldn't do it before you hit setup because then setup will run slowly, but after you hit setup, you can move it down if you want to watch it, and you'll see it more kind of incrementally adding little steps on it, right? Um, now the question is, you might, you might think to yourself, well, how do I know that the imitation stuff is actually working, right? All it's showing is that different things are happening. Well, you can check that. You can take this imitation slider and move it down to zero, right? And then you can see, does it happen slower or faster than I expect? Oh, actually, that happened faster. That was interesting. Maybe I didn't make the slower slide down as far. Let's try that again. Hold on. 0.5. Set up. Actually, a better way to check something like this is to go to the observer and do repeat 100 or repeat 20. Go. Because now I know I mean, so in 20 time steps with, with the global mutation at 0.5, I get to full saturation of the network, right? So now let's turn global limitation off, hit setup, repeat 20 go, and you can see I don't hit full saturation, right? So clearly imitation is happening and effectiveness, right? And so you can play around with this adoption rates and things like that. The one thing, and one critical piece that I would be put in jail if I didn't tell you about as a net logo instructor, right? is I forgot to talk about ticks, right? And ticks are very, very important. Um, and I just noticed that as I was trying to do that. So you need to, in NetLogo, tell it when a time step has completed. It doesn't know automatically. Even though it's NetLogo style to have go be a time step, there's no command, that's not part of the code. And so basically, the first thing you need, last thing you need to do in the setup is type reset ticks, right? Which will reset the tick counter. And then the go loop, at the end of it, you need to say tick, right? 
And now, when I hit setup and I hit go, you'll see there's this little tick counter telling me how many time steps into the model I've run. And that would be really useful once you want to start doing plots or things like that. So. Could you just go back to yeah. the So it's right at the end of the setup code, and then inside the Go loop right there. At the end of Go, think about it this way, you deal with ticks at the end of the commands, right? The end of setup, reset ticks. At the end of Go, tick, right? It's basically the way to think of it. Could you go down a little bit? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. And, and like if, 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 if uh, I think, Liz, I think you have the email addresses. I'm happy to send the slide deck and the actual code that we built in this class out to everybody. So, no, it'll have both of these. No problem. Yeah. And any questions? I hope this kind of, was this helpful at all? This could be a question. Okay, okay, good, good. Not, you know, I'm never quite sure if doing this little bit of an introduction is helpful, right? Like, like I said, the nice thing about NetLoyal, we used to run this beautiful workshop in Chicago back when there was this nice agent-based modeling conference Chicago, in Chicago here. It was three days long, and during that time, we'd have you building your own models by the end of the three days, because as you can see, it's very easy to get up and running on this. And we're kind of, right now, we're at that point where you know just enough to be dangerous and can go out and build, start playing around with this on your own. So uh, you really can get quite good at this pretty quickly. The beauty of NetLogo, and I, you know, like I said, I've worked in dozens of programming languages over the course of my life. I still use NetLogo anytime I build an agent-based model for the first time because the life cycle of development from the start to the end is much, much faster in NetLogo than it is. Even if yes, C++ runs faster, and Java runs faster, and all these things run faster, but it's quicker to build a model in this than it is in just about anything else out there. Well, I, I've got a few minutes, but I've got to get going pretty quickly. So if anyone has any additional questions, I'm happy to talk to you. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thanks again, Liz, for putting this all together. Yeah, so just wrapping up, if you would like a copy of the slides from today, just email me. If you need anything, uh, email me. Uh, don't put student on the top because I might not read that as quickly. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> put short course or whatever. Uh, do you have your email? What is your email? I know My email is, is, is W R A N D William Rand, basically William Rand at umd.edu. It's the easiest way. I got one of the shortest emails in existence. So. <laughs> and again, I, I, maybe one thing picked up today that everybody's willing to help each other or put them in the right direction. Maybe if you don't know, you'll know somebody that knows, and, and so that's part of it. So. so should we write to you for his? Yeah, yeah, he'll send it to me, and then I'll send it. I'll send it. Just say, there just say, is. please, uh, I want this. Right. Oh, and yes. I do have to make a quick plug. If any of you are interested, we do run a conference on complexity in business, but actually by complexity in business, we also include management and anything along those lines, right? So, you know, it could be management of forest systems or anything, right? Um, and so it might be interesting for you. Every year uh, in downtown DC, this year it's going to be October 30th and 31st. And we still have, the call is still open. Actually, it's due this weekend. But if, if you're a couple days late, let me know and I'll get it in there. Um, uh, for abstracts, so it's just a single abstract to submit and we uh, encourage presentations. If you go to our website, which is uh, just search for Center for Complexity and Business, you'll find us. And the information about submitting a call is right on there. Submitting an abstract is right on there. So we'd love to see any of you back in, at the end of October uh, talking about complex systems. Okay, cool. And this is really, really, really a treat. I've seen this given yes. a number of times. This is the best of the best of the best. So <laughs> you guys really got something special today to be able to do it that quickly, that succinctly, and that clearly. Cool. So we really Thanks. appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.